I've played tons of Nintendo 64 games. It was the era of my childhood. Many of you grew up on the NES or the Super Nintendo, but the Nintendo 64 was my bread and butter. I've played most of the games on the console, if not on physical hardware, than on an emulator that my dad put on my computer when I was in middle school. That being said, because I understand the Nintendo 64, I have my own opinions on what the most overrated Nintendo 64 games are, and that's what I'm going to discuss today. Now historically these videos have rustled feathers, and I do want to clarify that even if I feel a game is overrated, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad at all, in fact some of my favorite games may be on this list. But in the grand scheme of things, they are overrated. But that's a subjective thing, right? So don't get too mad at me, it's just an opinion, I cannot physically take those memories away from you. That being said, let's begin. Collecting things. It wasn't something that was abstract to us as kids of the 90s. We had baseball cards, trading card games out the ass, and every video game out there that was a 3D platformer or some iteration in a 3D world usually relied on collecting things. It was hardwired into who we are and we accepted it. Pokemon was the exact same way. We had two different games initially. We wanted to collect them all. Hell, it was even written on the damn box, and there were cards, there were movies, there was a TV show where young Ash Ketchum gets pity points from an entire Japanese region. True story. The Pokemon game that I owned growing up on the Game Boy was Pokemon Red, and I played it for a little bit. I played it a lot, actually. Then I let a neighbor borrow it, and then he moved. He never gave it back to me. He told me he was moving to Antarctica. But I was in the fifth grade, so, you know, I believed him, right? By the way, Justin Rodriguez, if you're out there, just know I eternally wish nothing more than perpetual shin splints in your adulthood. Sassy bitch. Anyway, at some point in my life, I managed to snag Pokemon Stadium, and I was excited. It was the first time I was able to check out these Pokemon in their real size, in what felt like a real combat system, which I found to be phenomenal. But that nostalgia faded pretty quickly in my adulthood, because the game itself is really fucking boring. It's broken down into a few things, the Gym Leader Castle, which is unfair, and we need to beat it twice, the Poke Stadium, which has four cups, a mini game island, and versus battles, and at the end of the day, after trying to get good at the Gym Leader Castle and failing at the Pokemon Stadium so many times, I was left playing non-stop mini games with my sister. And you would think with this being the second Pokemon Stadium game that they would figure it out. And yes, before you say, listen here you bourbon scented bitch, Pokemon Stadium is the first game, I've seen it. No, it's not. In Japan, they have Pocket Monster Stadium. I actually own it, believe it or not, I picked it up in Japan, and colloquially, it's known as Pokemon Stadium Zero, at least by the fandom. That's something you know now. Quest 64, it carries some repute, right? Mostly because it was the first RPG on the system, but that means nothing if it sucks. I remember playing this through and through and thinking, how can anyone take the time to remove literally everything that is tried and true in a genre from all the way back to Wizardry and Ultima, Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior, D&D CRPG titles, there was just a foundation of tropes and mechanics required for an RPG and Imagineer, they decided to just do whatever they wanted to. The game itself is very misleading. You're led to believe that you can simply play as Brian and go around Keltlin looking for your dad, and when you have the opportunity to level up, maybe you can spread your magic among the four elements that you control, right? But if you do that, you put yourself in a horrible position. And by the time I realized it, I was six hours into the fucking game. Oh, and you don't level up by killing monsters, you get items by killing monsters because there's no shops. The leveling system revolves around finding these white wisps and touching it. This game is dreadful and for some weird reason people love it. There's an entire Twitter community dedicated to loving Quest 64 and I just, I don't know why people even bother wasting their time remembering it. Conker's Bad Fur Day is a black sheep in not only Rare's library, but the Nintendo 64 library as a whole, and it's a cult classic because it's funny as hell. 
fighting the big mighty poo, trying to tickle a big boobed sunflower, getting pissed drunk and pissing on enemies, going to actual war, there's a lot going on here. It's funny because Conker was originally a kid's IP. He was a fun loving squirrel in Diddy Kong Racing, and he had his own Game Boy Color game that honestly wasn't that bad, and then he went on a bender, and now he's an M rated character. Don't get me wrong, the humor in the game, it, it's flawless and it hits pretty much everything that I would expect from Rare's sense of humor. The issue is, it gets old really quick. After the shock value wears off, we're just left with an exceptionally subpar overrated platformer. Now, I do kind of respect it because being a 3D platformer after Banjo and Donkey Kong 64, that's a tough act to follow. And we expected that. It's rare and I felt they fell short. It's also stupid expensive most of the time that I encounter it and it's just not worth it to me. It might be to you, but it's not to me. Diddy Kong Racing to me is the perfect racing game on the Nintendo 64. I genuinely loved it. It was a game that I rented so many times because I wanted to beat the bosses. And with me only having experience with Mario Kart 64, being in an open world with my kart, that was insane to me. I first played it at a demo kiosk at Blockbuster, and like I said, I rented it for weeks. Then I stopped playing it. Once I was an adult, I played the whole game, and holy shit, is it hard. It's not even technically difficult, right? The computer straight up cheats, either by severe rubber banding or by straight up cheating in the cases of the bosses jumping the gun. I thought I hit the restart button often playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. No, man. Diddy Kong Racing, 100%. I'm not gonna say that Mario Kart 64 was better, I'm not even gonna say that Crash Team Racing was better, but I did expect better from a company that was pumping out awesome games on the Nintendo 64. Star Fox is a well-known Super Nintendo game and an even more well-known Nintendo 64 game, but I really didn't like it. Now bear in mind, I've beaten it on all three paths, right? I'm not some kid that sat down, did the easy path, killed false Andros and said, that's it? I did the research. Game Facts was in its infancy, and every time I went to school, there were people talking about the other paths, so I kept renting it, playing the harder paths, looking for those divergences that I could use to unlock different areas, and I had a blast with it. But looking back on it now, it's a really muddy game, right? The frame rate on Aquas alone made me want to rip my hair out. I don't mind tedious challenges. Hell, if you watch my stream, I tend to do it every single day to the point where people probably think I torture myself for fun. I don't. The nostalgia hits very hard for this one, but to me the plot is paper thin, even Star Fox 2 did it better. Mario Kart 64, it's a game that I loved playing with my sister, with my cousins, and even as an adult we would play drunk driving Mario Kart 64 where we would have to pull over any time that we wanted to drink and you had to finish your beer before you crossed the finish line. It's just a game that stood the test of time and I appreciate it. But Mario Kart 64 is also really shifty, right? Even though it's a genre defining game, especially for the time, the AI is horribly unbalanced to the point where I was actually excited to check out Double Dash and see if they fixed all of these issues. Now it's easy to dismiss past games in lieu of understanding where the franchise will inevitably end up, but the handling and controls can be much to be desired. It's definitely a promotion from what Super Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo was, but it's one of those games that once you beat it, you're done until the next great racing game came out. At least that's how I perceived it. Super Mario 64 was my first Nintendo 64 game growing up. It was a pack-in, but on the same day, Christmas of 1998, I got more than just Mario 64. I also got Donkey Kong 64, Ocarina of Time, Banjo-Kazooie, Mario Kart 64. It was a great Christmas. The games just kept coming, and I had months, hell, years of entertainment ahead of me. But obviously I played Mario 64 first and I absolutely loved it. I knew all about Mario. I had played every previous Mario iteration over the course of my life. And now here I am as Mario in a 3D environment going around worlds that I never thought were possible. Then I grew up and I played this again. I really wanted to go after all of the stars and I was willing to take the task, but I soon realized that Mario 64 really isn't fun after about six hours. 
The later stages are straw grabs at best in terms of level design, and pretty much everything after the second key door is unbridled nonsense. Tall Tall Mountain, Wet Dry World, Tick Tock Clock, Rainbow Ride. Rainbow Ride in particular is a testament to the sins of mankind, especially with the camera being the way that it is. But all things considered, looking back, it was fun, and it paved the way for me to enjoy more games. Growing up, I never messed with Kirby stuff. I knew of it thanks to Super Smash Bros., but outside of that, I had never played a Kirby game to date. Now, as an adult, I've beaten the first Kirby game, Kirby's Dream Land on the Game Boy, and it's kind of an easy game to me, but it does get relatively tough, especially near the boss rush. But as a kid, when I was probably 9 or 10, I rented Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards and was vehemently bored. The ability combinations were unique. I'll give it that. The combo mechanic, that was alright as well. But the core mechanic of shitty controls is so momentum breaking, especially to retain interest from a younger demographic, right? I really felt like they didn't try. I didn't enjoy this game in the slightest, but franchise loyalists love to bring it up in conversation, and sometimes they get brutally mean if you talk ill about Kirby 64. But what's funny is that it never ends up in their top 5, much less their top 10 lists. So, I don't know. Maybe they just don't like you talking about Kirby poorly. Oh, fun fact, did you know that HAL Labs is called HAL Labs because they wanted to be one step ahead of IBM? True story, H is before I, A is before B, and L is before M. Something you know now. I remember everyone being exceptionally excited about Donkey Kong 64. People lost their bananas. But to be fair, so did Donkey Kong. Which is exactly what the whole premise of Donkey Kong 64 is, recovering the lost banana trove. Now what Rare failed to mention is that apparently Donkey Kong not only lost all 201 of his golden bananas, he's also lost 3,500 colored bananas between the 5 playable Kongs, 40 banana medals, 20 banana fairies, 40 blueprints, 8 boss keys, 10 battle crowns, and 2 specialty coins that you get from asinine Nintendo 64, emulated ports of Jetpack and Donkey Kong. And because of it to this day, Rare maintains the Guinness World Record for most collectible items in a video game. This was a collectathon to end all collectathons, right? It was a chore. It took me years to try to get everything, and even when I streamed this to completion about six years ago when I started streaming, I managed somehow to get all of the blueprints, all of the colored bananas, all the boss keys, and all the specialty coins. To me, it was much more worth it playing Spyro, because at the end of the day, I only needed to find gems. It was much more simpler, and even if Spyro had many games, they weren't trash. This game is filled to the brim with whatever idea Rare developers manifested, and I think it's severely overrated. Oh no! I can feel the fires of a thousand odd job mains stoking in the soda stained carpets of the 90s. Here comes the angry mobs from the endless aisles of blockbuster fame. It's time to shit on GoldenEye 007. A lot of people think that this was the start of the FPS genre, and you know what? You might be right, but I guarantee you, someone else out there would have figured it out. Probably Bungie with Halo, or literally any other company that utilized the perspective. GoldenEye to me is a hollow ass game, and that's probably because when it was designed, it wasn't meant to be a first person shooter. It was meant to be a rail shooter, hence why stages are just so fucking empty all the time. And usually when I talk to people about GoldenEye 007, their argument always seems to revolve around how fun the multiplayer is. But I'm sorry, 50% of a game that wasn't meant to feature said aspect does not make the game the greatest thing since the discovery of the Atom, right? It's a shooty game with a badass pause theme song. Thanks, Grant Kirkhope. That being said, I know I probably kicked a hornet's nest today, and I'll accept my stings with pride. I do look forward to everyone's commentary about my opinion today, so down below, feel free to let loose. I do read and respond to every single comment, even the mean ones. If you did happen to tolerate my horrible takes long enough to make it to the end of this video, you're already home here. We're a group of individuals who really enjoy remembering a time when life was just a little bit easier to live. So, if you want to go on a deep dive down tons of retro gaming content, feel free to subscribe. Finally, the most important thing you can do for me is to hit that thumbs up button as it directly impacts the visibility of the projects and videos that I work on every single day. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, fortify out.